Good evening, all. Thanks for inviting me. Um, as Pi said, I was licensed in uh, New Jersey in 1962. Uh, in 1966, I earned my first BXCC. Uh, in the 1980s, I was traveling around the world on business and started operating from Asia, specifically the United Arab Emirates for about, well, I still go there to operate when there's no COVID. Um, and I became more of a de-expeditioner than a home operator, although I still operate content. Uh, I currently have 3,140 um, challenge points. Uh, I'm at the top of the DXCC, but my love now is going around the world. So, uh, and I've lived here since 1986 and Pi still calls me in New York. So there you go. I'm, I'm not a native. So with that, I'm gonna play a little video, which will give you a couple of nice um, views of Baker Island, and then we'll go into the presentation. So let's see if this works. In 2018, in June, we went to a DXCC counter called Baker Island. And this is the story of it. We went at the bottom of the cycle. We went in a bad month for propagation, June. And everybody kept saying, don't do it, don't go. But that's when the US Fish and Wildlife Service said we could go for a number of reasons. So we went anyway. Why Baker? Um, hasn't been on the air since 2002. The last operation made 17,500 cues. And prior to that, there were very small the expeditions there. So as it turned out, Baker was sixth on the wanted list. Where is it? Well. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's on the equator and it's near the date line. And it's 1900 miles from Hawaii. This is an overview at 
is a little better than the uh, video to give you an idea of how big it is. Um, it has three miles of coastline, but at its widest point, it's 0.81 square miles. So it's about a mile across at its depth. A little bit of history. Um, it has Nantucket roots. The whalers made it there and discovered it in 1834. They were on the uh, Gideon Howland ship, um, but the captain named Baker after himself. So it's called Baker Island. In the mid 1800s, as happened in many parts of the world, the US passed the Guano Act and they claimed Baker and Howland and Jarvis and a whole bunch of the islands that, that were uninhabited in the Pacific um, to mine guano. Midway was another one. Um, they actually set up a little colony in the 1850s, but once the guano was uh, cleaned off the island, they abandoned it. In the 1940s, the military went in. In the 1930s, a group of Hawaiians were dropped off on both Baker and Howland and other islands in the area like Pitcan, like uh, Palmyra, um, to try to colonize. Um, but once the war broke out, the military uh, moved in. And that, and you, you remember the picture, you can see what's left of the uh, coral landing strip. Um, as I said, it's just north of the equator. It's treeless. There's not much there. Um, we were told it never rains on Baker. You'll see later that it does rain. Um, seven to 10 million birds, noisy. That's the QRN on the island. They never shut up, even at night. There are terns, boobies, minor frigates, not the ones with giant ones that live up in the trees. Noddies, tropic birds, uh, curlews, flubbers. We didn't see a lot of flubbers on this trip. Uh, in 1974, it became a national wildlife refuge. And in 2014, a whole bunch of these Pacific wildlife refuges were merged together. And that now includes Wake and Johnston and Palmyra, all the rare DFCC entities um, to the south of Hawaii are now part of this Pacific remote island monument. Um, as I said, in the 30s, a bunch of Hawaiian students aboard a ship called the Estaca were dropped off on this godforsaken rock. Um, they tried to grow things, they didn't grow. Um, they did fish and they eked out a little bit of a survival. Um, on Baker, they create a little village called Meyer Town, and you'll see some pictures of the rubble that's left. Um, Amelia, Amelia Earhart um, in 1936 was supposed to land on its sister island called Howland. She never made it. They wondered if for a while she mistook Baker and tried to land there because there was a landing strip. Um, but they didn't find any evidence that she landed on Baker. These are the operators. Um, everybody on this team was known to me or Kevin, who uh, was the other manager of this, the expedition. Um, James Brooks was with me on VP8ORK, South Orkney. He made the video you saw in the beginning. Everybody on this team had been on a fish and wildlife island. We didn't want to take people who fish and wildlife didn't know and might question how we would keep the island pristine as it was. And it took us two years to get a permit to actually go. Lots of discussions, lots of um, negotiation. Um, so we applied for the permit in early 2016. We initially applied to go to Howland because we wanted it to be a uh, commemorative de expedition. But uh, there were um, non-indigenous animal life, meaning rats, 
on uh, Howland and they were in the middle of eradicating them and they didn't want any humans showing up that weren't on fish and wildlife. Um, again, finally in 2017 in September, through a rigorous um, procedure of which there were two other groups that were applying to go, our group received a special use permit. Um, we could only go from a US port. That's so it could be inspected by the Coast Guard. Um, a fish and wildlife representative had to go with us to make sure we didn't do something bad. Um, all our clothes had to be frozen. I'll never forget the look on my wife's face when she opened the downstairs freezer and literally a month of clothes were among the food and everything had to be new. Um, we had to follow guidelines. Oh, sorry about that. Let's have a look at this. Um, we had to follow specific guidelines. The fuel and the generators had to be in burns. So if there was a spill, the tents had to be frozen and inspected and fumigated. And all our personal hygiene had to be made from biodegradable chemicals. So no crest. We uh, had to prepare to have seven days of food and water stored on the island at all times in case we couldn't get over the reef. We were, even though we were 13 people on the team, only 11 operators could sleep on the island. We never could figure out that one. Uh, vertical antennas only, uh, guide and flag, so we didn't have any bird strikes. No fishing or swimming. If we wanted to fish or swim or dive, those were different permits. We had a permit for a specific use, ham radio. Um, we had to leave the island as if we were never there. In the beginning, that meant we had to collect our human waste and take it back to the boat. Um, before we went, another group of NOAA had been there and they determined that getting on and off the island was so dangerous that we might get swamped and dump our human race, uh, human waste in the water and they didn't want that on the reef. So they gave us specific rules about how to build a latrine on coral rock. Um, and we even had to get permission to call it a commemorative the expedition. So we had two choices. We could go from Hawaii or American Samoa. We decided American Samoa saved us a couple of days on the ocean and we started looking for a boat in Fiji. Um, to go from Fiji, we started asking around. We uh, talked to 3D2AG who lives on Fiji about possible ships. We searched the internet and another ham in Florida, believe it or not, who heard we got a permit suggested we look at a boat called the Naya. It had been to Baker and Howland. It had been part of the National Geographic experienced crew that was looking for Amelia Earhart. They knew where they were going. We talked with the uh, boat owners. We sent two of our crew to Fiji to look at the ship and discuss what our plans were. Um, we told them about the compliance with fish and wildlife, having to leave from American Samoa. And these people knew the island and were actually warning us about it's always a hundred and something degrees, there's no shelter. They knew where we were going, we hired them. Um, it was a month long trip between the uh, leaving and loading up of the ship and returning to Fiji. And the price of the charter was $350,000. So what is the Nile? It's a liveaboard scuba dive boat, um, steel hull, 120 feet long, sleeping quarters for 18 plus crew, nine knots. It was fairly, fairly quick when you look at sailboats and similar ships. Large storage capacity because we were going to have two tons of gear. Um, knew where we were going, excellent reputation, and we hired them. Planning, we had these tents left over from the South Orkney. So we 
cleaned them. We put them together in Georgia, made sure they were still worthy. We used Pelican cases to protect the radios, which we got from Elecraft. Tested everything, including the BGAN, the satellite upload of the logs at K6PD's house. Um, stepper motors were all tested. Um, pack marked, labeled by mode. So when we got to the island, every piece of equipment had a marking on it, which tent to go to, which station to go to. Here we are assembling the gear before taking it to the airport. As I said, it was six kids, two tons of gear. We shipped out an air freight and it arrived in Fiji on June 1, 2018. We had big plans for operating. Remember two of our crew members couldn't stay on the island. We were gonna operate from the boat, one of the stations. We set up a 900 megahertz link Everything was connected by Ethernet, all three stations. We had a server, so all six radios were being logged on the main server. We had Ethernet around the island with repeaters. Everything worked fine in California. When we got to the island, the boat was rocking. There was no way the remote 900 megahertz link was gonna keep everything going. So we started shuttling a couple of the operators to and from the island. This is some of the software. We had remote software, we had MMPTY, WSJT, um, ethernet ports. We used computers um, that were three inch by five inch hung on the back of the monitors. So we kept some of the uh, power levels down, they're called nooks. And as I said, everything was tested in advance and everything worked on the island. The only technical problem were the relay back to the ship. So all the operators had to be in Pongo Pongo for the inspection on June 19th. But a bunch of us went earlier on June 14th to load up the Naya made sure things were loaded on the boat in the reverse order that we wanted them to come off. We knew the plan was to start taking items to the island, most importantly, the generators and the tent, because if something happened and we couldn't get off the island, the people setting up, we needed the tents, the generators, and the food and water. So we loaded the boat in the reverse order of what we wanted on the island. First, the Naya left Fiji on the 15th to Pongo Pongo. We all met as a crew in Pongo Pongo on the 19th, left on the 20th for base. Here we are on the 19th, meeting the whole team and the whole crew of the ship for the first time and going over those plans on what to do when we got to the island. And the people of Fiji are very welcome. Every night we had a concert. There's the crew. You can see that there was more crew than ham radio operators. And they, we could not have done this without. Um, if you see Big Mo, the skip driver down on the bottom, he could have quarterbacked any NFL team. He would pick up a 500 pound case of something and just drag it along by himself. And Vanessa, who was sort of like the uh, crew um, hostess, she could lift anything Mo could lift. Um, here's the chef preparing dinner. This is our meals. 
20th, we left right on time, passing the Fish and Wildlife Co Coast Guard inspection. A couple of pictures of on the way, we operated FP8, Maritime Mobile, because we passed through some very rare grid squares. And as you know, people collect everything in ham radio, including grid squares where there is no land. The seas weren't too rough. We passed right by an island called Nicomorora. Nicomorora is interesting in that there is a, the British military found a skeleton, a skeleton of a woman who would have died the same age as Amelia Earhart. They also found some airplane parts offshore. Um, they also found a woman's um, uh, uh, you know, where you keep the makeup compact. Um, and they have since done more investigation of the skeleton, which they sent back to England. And they're convinced it's her, but they haven't gotten any DNA off it to prove it. So anyway, we were going to dive off Nicomororo for a couple of hours because there was a picture taken that they thought was a landing gear. Well, we had to tell, because we were entering the water of Kiribati, that we wanted to do that. And they said, oh, we'd love you to dive. Come pick us up. The problem was to go to Kiribati to pick them up would have been two days sailing in each direction. So that idea went by the boards. But it was good to think that we may have dived and found the plane of Amelia Earhart. As it turned out, National Geographic went there after we were on Baker. They spent two weeks diving and they didn't find anything. So here is that little area where you see the light water that from the sky would look like a landing strip. It was really a lagoon and everybody figured she landed there, but there's no sign. Of it. We finally crossed the equator. We started seeing birds, good sign. And on the morning of June 25th, five days later, we woke up to Baker Island. And if you see that little line sticking up in the middle, that's the day beacon because Baker Island has a lighthouse on it, uh, an unlit lighthouse, which is why they call it a day beacon. You can only see it. Today. Here's our welcoming party, a bunch of birds, millions of birds. And as you got on the island, you could smell the guano and that smell never left you. Here I am with a Kevin and a couple of others from the ship heading to the island. There we are beginning the survey where to set up. The initial permit said we had to stay on the beach. Well, when we arrived and it was 7 a.m., the beach was already 100 degrees. And the hill you see to the east of us was blocking the wind. So we would have roasted there. Our fish and wildlife monitor said, uh, you're going to die here. You're going up on this is our pontoon boat. Um, Noah had been there about a month before us, and they had a boat with a slight um, undercarriage, and they radioed ahead before we left and said, if you come here with the equipment we think you're gonna use, you will die. You won't get over the reef because where we were planning to land, no one had been there in about six years and the reef was filling in and it wasn't as deep as we had heard. So um, Rob, the Naya owner, went out and bought this little red pontoon and his wife who had dinner with us before we left, said, you know, most people have midlife crises and buy a, mid a red BMW. He bought a pontoon. This is how we got on the island. If you look, you'll see some stingrays swimming around the boat.
So as you can see, you had to wait for the right wave. And that was a boat with one person on it. You can imagine when it's full of the gear going in, but we didn't lose anything. We had a couple of people fall off, but we didn't lose any gear. Um, here's the crew in action carrying the heavy equipment. Here's our fish and wildlife biologist helping drive in the stakes for the tents. She was great. There's more equipment. I believe there were 20 odd trips bringing in the uh, gear. The really heavy stuff, they had a bigger pontoon. They dropped it off in the water and the Fijian pulled it into shore. Here's another shot of the island. We set up our tents on the west side, which is where the access was. Um, we had digital sideband and CW tents, operating station. Here it is offshore, north, south. The central part was where the lighthouse was. So the CW site had three stations. Headquarters, which is where we ate our meals. Each day, the Naya brought in a hot cooked meal. We had snacks and we had breakfast, which was basically cold cereal, which we ate on the island. Made our own instant coffee, which I ate. Um, Saiban location. And then the Digi site had two stations. Here are our antennas. We had five antennas at the CW site, including the 160 antenna. Saiban had two VDAs, um, a big IR and a small IR, all stepper. And the digital tent had our six meter station and a big IR and a small IR. If you look in the lower right of this picture, you'll see the weather port shelters. We used them on VP8 ORK. Um, they did not breathe. So we bought new coverings for them for Baker that were wet, that were more uh, reflective of the light and more airy. And we also, instead of having 20 foot long, uh, 24 foot long tents, we broke them down to two tents. So two shelters on South Orkney became four shelters on Baker. And here's Kevin and myself and and 7 cw and Allie uh, hanging out in the uh, man tent. As I said, each day we got food brought in by the Naya. We ate at our operating stations. Those that were operating the rest in the food tent. Here we are putting up some of the antennas. This is the big IR at the CW. Here are two erected antennas. Notice uh, the banners flying. We didn't, we, we don't believe we had a bird strike. There was one dead bird on the beach. It was nowhere near the antenna. Um, she didn't count it as a bird strike. And that was important because the fish and wildlife rules were, if birds were dying because of our inhabitants on the island, we had to shut down. And leave. More erection of the antennas. This is, what the antenna site looked like from the CW tent. This is one of those two element vertical arrays that we had. They were initially used on the St. Brandon, the expedition 20 years earlier. They still are excellent performers. They can be directed at your target audience. We had a six meter three element beam. We were going in late June. We thought we'd have some six meter propagation back to the States. We didn't. Um, the view from the beach, you can see the tents in the middle, um, sleeping tents. We had big Agnes tents from REI. They were great. We called them the Hilton. Uh, go in there during the day and it's over 100 degrees. Go in there at night and it's a cool 85. Sand everywhere. You just lived with. Allie had her own private pup tent away from us. This is the infamous latrine built to fish and wildlife specs. Um, they were digging in sand on top of a coral rock. 
and it was about a four hour job. And here it is. Imagine closing that up on a 110, 120 degree beach and doing your thing. Here's the shower. Here is Mike and KN4 EEI who kept the seven generators going. Here are some of the views of the generators. Now look at the bird in the uh, top picture. Um, it adopted us. About a day after we set up the generators, it moseyed over to the two outside the uh, digital tent and never left day and night. It must have been something about the humming of the generator, but he wouldn't go. You can see some of the requirements of Fish and Wildlife. There was a, bat, a bucket of sand, there was a fire extinguisher, and there had to be protection against spills. We had eight L craft stations. This is what one of the stations would have looked like a controller. This was actually the digital tent. There were 31 places we operated on. We had stations on 20 meters around the clock. Um, the bands did close in the middle of the night. It was June, it was the bottom of the cycle. We were on the equator. But we tried to be on all bands, on all modes. 31 ways to work us. Um, our target audience was Europe. Um, it was where it was most rare. Um, we had easier shots into Japan, North America, and the uh, BKZL, but it was hard to get to Europe. Here's Kevin and I, that was in the sideband tank. Here's Bud on CW. Arnie, our doctor, he's been all over the world. He was with us on Midway. He was part of the team. Um, he was our first choice as a doctor, and you've probably worked in 50 places around the globe. Neil, VA-70X, he was part of the Mozambique, the expedition we did back in 2013. George, George was our low band expert. Here I am teaching George how to operate FP8 on 160. 9V1YC, he made the video you saw in the beginning. He was with me on pp 8 ork Midway, various other places. Tommy is AA7JV's alter ego, where George goes, uh, Tommy goes. This is my good friend, JN1THL. Those of you who are in CW Ops know Ken. I met Ken in 1987. I had just been in Dubai. He worked for our distributor of the company I worked for in Japan. And he was visiting the company in Massachusetts at Cordage Park in Plymouth. And he kept looking at me funny in the meeting. And he said, there's a ham radio operator that has your name. And I asked him what ham radio was. And he started describing it as I started laughing. And I said, yes, Ken, I am that Don Greenbaum. And it turned out he had just worked me like a month before from Dubai. Uh, he's been at my house with his family. I've been in Japan at his house in Tokyo. He's been with me in about five countries operating. Went with us to Mozambique. Um, he was my first choice as a Japanese speaking ham and we were putting paper together. Um, here he is operating. Uh, he made about, by the way, he made more QSOs than any other member of the team. We were working in four hour shifts. And if there was an empty radio, Ken didn't sleep. He just went to the empty radio, mostly working the Japanese stations. And a third of our queues were with Japan. And a lot of Japanese operators don't speak English. So he was a godsend on this trip. You'll notice Kevin with his ever-present pillow. We had a six meter beacon. The six meter beacon was on around the clock the first three days. And it was a waste of a station. So on day four, we converted it to an FP8 station. We kept trying six, 
but the Japanese station weren't even here in Hawaii the, the week we were there. And by the way, two days after we left, there was a massive opening from the States to Hawaii. Now, we don't know if they would have worked all the way to Baker, but it's just the way it works. There's the Digi Palace. We had a Ritty station, we had an FD8 station. Ritty rates were 80 to 90 an hour. FT8 using the new mode called the Expedition Mode, which we wrote with K1JT for this the Expedition um, was much faster. So after three days, we converted it to two FT8 stations. And we found one operator could operate both stations at the same time. So when I wasn't operating sideband or a CW operator wasn't on, we didn't schedule anybody to be on Digi, but there was always somebody on Digi. up to radio. 17 and 20. So one operator could queue up stations because the way the FT8 in the expedition mode work is you could click on call signs that you see on the incoming box. And that would put them down in the queue. And it would work up to five stations at the same time. And then you go to the other radio. And again, you could queue up five stations. You could queue up as many as 10. So we literally were working stations when the band was open on two bands with um, two different radios. And we've now figured out a way to do that with one radio. So you could have one radio, two bands um, on, on FT8, the expedition mode. Really made a difference in how many people you could do. And here is me operating 160, and along comes a call, AA1V, with a minus 12. And we were working at the same time, Japan, Australia, West Coast. And our good friend Don, my good friend Don, your good friend Don, making a 160 contact. Now, what's the beauty of FT8? I know a lot of people are an FT8 fan, but FT8 is a low power mode. And instead of a kilowatt, you could have worked up using 100 watts with a wire in your app. And a lot of people did. That is the Chinese woodpecker. And we we're a lot closer to you are. So what happened is when that noise hits the band, you generally turn off your radio and go to sleep or watch the bird. But FT8 decodes through that mess. And we were able to make QSOs over that racket. But there's a downside of FT8. Anybody can copy your call. And what happened? is people pirated KH7Z. But one of the pirates was not smart enough when he entered our call in the call box to change the grid square. And we were getting all these requests to check the lock that people know they worked on. And one ham from Vienna said, I know I worked you. I saw other people working you. And he sent me a JPEG when we got home of his QSO. And I'm looking at this picture and I'm saying, he's not in the log. He's not in the FT8 log that it creates of all the activity. And then it dawned on me. The pirate was operating from KO77, which is downtown Moscow. And not only that, but the signal report that people were hearing him was plus seven, and you, you just don't hear Baker Island at the Antipode from Vienna at plus seven, as good a mode as FT8 is. 
So a lot of the people we started sending this picture to saying, you work Moscow, not Baker Island. However, there were a lot of people in the log, almost 900 of them, who never made a CUSA with us on CW or sideband. And it was a very productive mode. So just briefly, high rates, a better digital mode than RIDI. Um, people who don't have good antennas were able to work us. Hell, AA1V worked us on 160, but Don has a good station. I'm just kidding. Um, you get digital FT8 just as well as you get it for RIDI. A lot of new operators that don't operate CW were able to get us in the log. As I showed you with the Russian, with the Chinese woodpecker, DQRM is not a problem. QRM is not a problem. It's a less stressful mode for the de-expeditioner. As I said, I'd come off a four hour shift on 20 meters working Italian, and I'd go and unwind working uh, FT8. And it's going to be a great remote operation mode. And you'll see that if and when there's another D expedition that I'm on. It's so easy that Allie, our biologist, would go in there and play FT8. This is uh, some of the midday uh, snoozing. Remember I said it was 110 degrees in these? When you've operated about 12 hours a day radio, you'll sleep in any condition. Remember it never rains on Baker Island. This is a storm that blew in on day two. We had just gotten all the antennas settled. And in this blue, knocked down about half our antennas and nobody was in the digital time when it hit. And when it left, you could take the KPA 1500 and turn it sideways and water would run it. it the radios came back to life. It was amazing. We lost a couple of keyboards, we lost the computer, but the radios were great. Here's the Baker Island sign when we arrived. Here's the Baker Island sign when the Naya crew got done repairing it. Some of the flags, the Heil headset, one of our other sponsors, everybody had their own faux headset. Some of the meetings we had each day, what areas of the world were we missing based on the pilot. Some of the birds. Here's the Loran World War II station. It's still there. We were told not to go anywhere near it. It's a historic site, and you certainly wouldn't want to climb those old towers. Here's some of the Meyer Town remains of the settlement in the 30s. A couple of the Meyer Town residents got killed during a Japanese bombing raid. Here's an old Guano era anchor rotting away. Here's an old crane that the uh, army left after World War II. An old bulldozer. Here's me trying to drive an old truck. The birds. Wow. pictures of birds. The Pacific has great sunset. And these were exceptional. First night there, we had a full moon. We had to use red flashlights so we didn't disturb the wildlife. The birds made a racket all night. They didn't worry about disturbing us. The heat, the birds, the sand, life is the exposition. This is the day beacon. This is what happened to the day beacon during the day. All the uh, hermit crabs, because there's nowhere to shelter, either went in the ocean or piled up on top of, the, of themselves in the day beacon. When you got bored, we had hermit crab races. Now, we were told not to disturb the wildlife, but the biologist had no trouble 
doing that. Well, July 5th came soon enough. Time to pack up, trek down to the beach. Back on the boat. While we were operating, the uh, Naya crew walked around the whole island collecting garbage. We loaded up the boat, said goodbye to Baker Island, and the Baker dolphin pod let us out. I bet they were a couple of miles in front of the boat, around the boat. We did some fishing on the way back. There was no fishing allowed in the reserve. We caught up on some sleep. Here's a quick tour of the boat. I won't bore you with it. Each, each two of us had a room with its own bathroom. Those were the bunks. It was pretty fancy. We had a little celebration at the end. <laughs> So again, we left, some of us got there on June 14th, July 13th was when we returned back to the home port. Finally, Fiji. Customs was done on the boat. They came aboard, they were fed breakfast, they stamped their passport. Where did the $450,000 cost to do this come from? Three quarters from North America. 13% Europe, 9% Asia. Half the money came from the team. Foundations a quarter, individuals a quarter. How did we do? We said the object was all time new ones. We stayed on 20 meters. At one point, we had eight stations active on 20 meters. Daily QSOs. Remember, the previous expedition there made 15,000 QSOs. Our total was 69,000. On June 30th, which was a weekend, we hit our peak. We made close to 11,000 contacts in one day. Uh, N6PSC said, I don't know when these guys had time for a bio break. Well, you saw the outhouse. We didn't want to take bio breaks. How did we do? There's a mega expedition chart. Um, we were pretty high on the uh, list of unique call signs. 18,000 unique people. The object was make sure everybody who wanted at least one queue could make one queue. And Europe was 5,600 unique queue so, which was pretty good over the North Pole. 149 countries worked. 17% of all the queues were Europe. Again, queue so's per band, 20 meters, the money band. You could see the difference FP8 made, 17,000 QSOs. New England, we had 293 unique call signs in the log, representing 863 different band modes. 12 people in New England only made one QSO. And all those QSOs were on FP8. From the feedback around the world, 31 ways to work us, JA4DND. My old call was WB2DND. JA4DND worked us in 29 slots. You ask how he missed us on FT8 on 160 and 60. It's not allowed in Japan. Otherwise, he would. There's some of the pilots. AA1V was our chief pilot. We went the wrong time of the year, wrong time of the cycle. 43 foot vertical antennas. Everybody said, why are you spending that much money on the boat? Well, we think we were. Um, storms said you couldn't go other times, fish and wildlife wouldn't let us. Close to three years from the time we started applying for it, we got the permit, it was the bottom of the cycle, we went. And I don't think if we went on any other boat, 
we would have been successful. So here we are on the island, Northern California gave us the most money of any the expedition, of any the foundation. They were um, $75,000. Telecraft, radios, DX engineering gave us coax, gave us uh, anything we wanted. Here's the QSL card. We hope you have one. Bottom line, we went there to give Fish and Wildlife uh, proof that we could run a DX expedition without breaking rules, getting injured, ruining the island, and putting a lot of all-time new ones in the uh, in the log. Thank you. Okay. Hey, I, John. Uh, thank you. That I, I I have a couple of questions, and then we'll let uh, let some of the others. But you got to tell me the whole thing about you guys wanted to go to Howland, and it said uh, what they said that hams and rats didn't uh, they, they weren't they weren't good company for each other or something like that. I, I no, they like... were afraid we bring more rats on the island. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, and look, <laughs> you put thirteen hams together. Some of them are rats. Yeah, that's that was my my take. Right. right. Okay. Now the whole thing of I, I and I'm wondering whether anybody wants to ask the question that doesn't know the definition of guano. But you know, I, something that comes to mind with that is uh, I was remembering that a character in in um, the uh, the the uh, Doctor Strangelove was Lieutenant Bat Guano, and. Uh, and, and, and the, 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 I'm wondering whether you had any insects there. You guys, you know, had like the tents open and everything else. Whether I would think that that would be something that would have been uh, around a lot of guano. Well, there weren't, except on day two, Allie noticed a ladybug. Hmm. Ladybugs are not native to the island, nor have they ever been registered as being on the island. And she was terrified that we brought him with our tents. And she, was wow. getting, and she mentioned it to us saying, you sure you fumigated this right? And uh, I inspected it. I didn't see anything. And there aren't any ladybug bugs in Fiji either. Well, two days later, she was on the other side of the island. And there were millions of them. Oh, wow. And that's the problem of these ecological systems that somebody on a yacht must have stopped off at Baker and in or was going by Baker and a ladybug flew off the ship. Now they have a ladybug problem, which they don't think is a problem, but there weren't mosquitoes. There were these tiny sand gnats, which are known to be in the Pacific. But the problem was sleeping in the tents, the crabs kept coming in shade so the it wasn't an insect problem it was the millions of hermit crabs which are native there and it's their island i i, kind of, I heard that uh, that was a problem uh, on clipperton when they were when they were talking about clipperton and how they would just you know they'd climb all over everything and the equipment and everything when they were operating. we had them crawling up the sides of the table Jeez. <laughs> and so, they could operate ft8 and they, yeah, <laughs> and anybody can do it. So, you know, you made me think, I mean, I, I gotta, you, you might wanna just describe a little bit of what you used for, uh, I think James probably did some of the video, but um, it, the quality of the videos and the, um, the, the photographs was absolutely outstanding. So, you know, what, what, we, what cameras were used for that? Oh, you would ask that question. Um, we had a Phantom 4 as the drone, um, I can't vouch for what the video camera was, but James is a professional mm -hmm. videographer and he had these small cameras that were, you know, this was all very high definition stuff. Uh, Ken Tanuma took most of the pictures of the birds and other ham operators um, and he had a very fine camera too. So, uh, you know, there was a Nikon D something. I no, the but the thing the thing was the quality was outstanding uh, all the way throughout that. So you know it was obvious, and and uh, I'm sure, yeah, it was good to see Ken there too. I, and I but I didn't realize just how outstanding an operator he was. So uh, you know that's you can you can uh, when next time you talk with him, tell him that I was uh, I, very, very I appreciate it. I always take Ken with us because he yeah. makes us look good. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Well, look at let's let's uh, open this up. See if anybody else has any any questions to ask. But I was fortunate enough that I was get, able to get in the log. But I got to tell you, it was in the early days of me trying to um, uh, mess around with FT8, and I never at that time I never did get it down. And so that was one thing I didn't do was to get a digital uh, QSO with you guys. But I did. I definitely needed to get you on CW. I had worked the other guys you know, 20 years before on, on phone. So I was very appreciative of that. And I did get you in a couple of bands, but, um, you know, let's, let's let it open up here and see if anybody else uh, has uh, any questions for you. I have a question. K1WCC. Hey, Henry. Yeah. And that question is, uh, how did you, how did you find a freezer big enough to uh, freeze those tents? So they passed inspection. Ah, so we had them fumigated in California and we shipped them to Fiji. And because they were in Fiji isolation so long, if you couldn't fumigate, you had to freeze. You fumigated and then they were kept in quarantine. You didn't have to put them in the freezer. Um, so we, we, we avoided that, but they were fumigated by chemicals. The clothes we couldn't, that's why we froze them. Okay, they, they seem pretty big. Yeah. Put it in a freezer. Hey Don, this is Rick N1DC. I'm just curious, uh, how much power were you running on each of the stations? So we had KPA 500. We had one KPA 1500 for 160. So, and then when you're operating FT8 in multi QSO mode, you're dividing the stream by the number of QSOs. So, on average, the FT8 Qs were 100 watts. Well, maybe a little more, but not much. But uh, except for 160, we were 500 watts. Thank you. Yeah, this is Jack N1QE. Uh, I got a quick question on what was the tidal difference there? You mentioned it was very shallow trying to get over the reefs. Did it affect you not being able to get over the reefs at some point? Yes, we had windows. Okay. At low tide, the reef was just below the surface. Um, we probably, I think, I think they said it was about eight feet. Eight foot difference? Yeah. In it wasn't very much. Yeah. And you couldn't get over the reefs on the north, south, and western side of the island. And in fact, there are shipwrecks um, from military uh, landing craft on the eastern side of the island. They tried it. Yeah. Thank you. And I would, I, you know, when you said shipwrecks, I, I had that written down as a question here, thinking about, about in the past, historically, uh, I would guess where that thing had absolutely no marking whatsoever, and it was just, you know, like three feet above uh, sea level or whatever, that there must have been throughout the years people that just ran into it in the dark or ran into it even in broad daylight without, uh, it, it was, was there, was there uh, uh, you know, any talk about uh, shipwrecks in that area? No, I think it's not a trade route. You, not a lot of people go by um, Baker, but there are wrecks out there, but um, Nicomororo had tons of them, and I think that's because it's closer, it's further south, it's closer to Fiji, it's closer to the Kiribati. There's not a heck of a lot going on up there, I think. Probably weren't any whales in that area on a regular basis or something. Well, the like whalers that. found it, but they well, probably yeah, but <laughs> down hundreds of years ago. Yeah, I mean, but sometimes the whalers would find things by mistake in the middle of the night. Right. right. Hey, Don, this week again, I got a question. I noticed there's a doctor as part of the team and I'm just curious, um, what kind of capabilities did you have for emergency medical you know, treatment and what would constitute then the need to you know, get somebody off the island quickly if there was like a broken leg or something? Could that be handled by the doctor? We were prepared for um, bone breaks, we were prepared for 
abrasions. We were not prepared. Um, by the way, the, the doctor's a urologist, which oh, is a good right. thing to have when you're a bunch of <laughs> five-year-old men on an island. However, um, Arnie was, Arnie could take care of the breaks and the bruises, anything serious, we'd be on, and there's nowhere to fly in a plane. Mm -hmm. um, you might be able to get a faster boat out there, um, but we were pretty much, luckily we didn't, um, we had a couple of members that might have, you know, had a little heat stroke, but nothing, nothing like threatening. Interesting. But never so, go anywhere without a doctor. Sometimes. But Dawn, were the, were the, um, uh, did you find the natives there uh, that, that, were, that you were involved with there coming up from Fiji and everything and in uh, American Samoa, did you find that they were as friendly on South Orkney? <laughs> we didn't have to walk around clanging pipes. Hot for people and, and, and would you ever complain about the heat again if you ever do one of the uh, Arctic, uh, Antarctic Island groups? I think I would rather go back to a 110 degree island than the Southern Ocean. Okay, gotcha. I gotcha. Somebody's got a radio on in the background there. Just turn that off. Anybody else have any, any questions here for Dawn? Don, one, uh, one other question. I'm just curious. Were, were there any equipment failures at all? Um, computer keyboard. One of the generators near the end um, went out. But two of the radios and two of the linears had water in it, and they still worked a day later. Um, so none of the Elecraft radios failed. None of the computers failed. Um, we had trouble with the satellite link at times. The began wouldn't find the bird because um, none of the satellites are near Baker um, or aimed at Baker. Um, and then the 900 megahertz link was a total failure because of the boat. But in terms of radios for working the world now. I saw I saw what I saw something that was and it said it was the mooring line in one of those videos. Now, we and it looked as though it was a float. Did that go all the way to the shore? Yeah. So Noah, which goes there every three to five years, planted in the reef. We weren't allowed to do that, but Noah actually planted in the reef an anchor uh, many years ago. And that's what Noah hooks up to. And they told us where it is. And it's a secret because they don't want anybody in the reserve. But they told us where to dive and find it. And that was the only time we were allowed to dive in the water um, to hook up to it. Because otherwise, the boat would have had to just keep circling the island. And that would have used up, A, it would have been more dangerous, and B, it would have used up a lot of fuel. Now, one of those storms came in was so bad that the Naiad unconnected from the mooring and actually went out to sea. We woke up and we didn't see the Naiad. We're going, what's going on? Um, or some of us were up operating. We were wondering where it disappeared to. And then we looked at the sky. And we realized because the last thing they wanted was to get washed up on the roof. We'd still be there. Wow. Well, okay. So, so uh, that's that, that. That certainly makes sense. But what may, what I what I thought of there as an afterthought, or or for any time in the future, would be that if there's that ability to have a line that's going over like that, and you had the you had the problem with the 900 megahertz link, could a cat cable no. be strung to shore? No. no, they were pretty far offshore. Um, what's cat? 300 feet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any, anyone else have any, any, any questions here for Don? Yeah, uh, Peter Casey, one HHO. Hello, Don. Yep. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering, um, sunrise, sunset, what was, what was the times? Uh, it's right on the equator, it's about 12, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, interesting, very good, thank you. 
Hey, Don. Yep. If there was one thing you could do differently if you were going back, what would that be? Don't go back. <laughs> it was it was hot. It was brutal. Um, and there's so many other top 10 countries I'd like to visit. Um, there, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm actively working on going to one of the other KH. So um, I wouldn't go back to Midway. I've been there. I wouldn't go back to Wake. Um, I, I'd like to hit all the KHs. Um, I've been to zero, four, um, nine, one. So there's a few more I can put on here. Thank you. Are we talking curry? We're not talking anything yet. Okay. Okay. And 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 uh, Kingman is uh, is never never again to be right. Uh, yeah, they deleted it, right? Yeah. They deleted it, but then they undeleted it, didn't they? For a while, or they they deleted? No, that uh, was Midway. All right. Yeah, Midway, and then they, they deleted undeleted. Midway. Yeah. yeah, and then they undeleted it. Right. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, I'm thankful that uh, I was able to work you guys there and appreciate all that effort that went in there. That was an outstanding presentation. We certainly thank you for that. Cool. Well, we were glad to work with you. And we're going to tell Don that you were talking about him during the presentation. Oh, he'll watch this, I'm sure. Okay, very good. Thanks, Don. You're quite welcome. This was fun. Good thank night, all.